Colonel Jerry Kadick was a U.S. Marine Corps officer who rose through the ranks to ultimately command the air group headquartered at Marine Corps Air Station El Toro in California. In the spring of 1988, the 45-year-old fighter pilot was flying a performance demo in an F-18 Hornet as part of the annual El Toro Air Show when something went horribly wrong. Colonel Kadick was a combat-tested fighter pilot with thousands of hours in tactical jets. Aviators with his level of experience don't normally fly into the ground. So how did this crash happen? It starts with the difference between being qualified and current, something that matters in a lot of professions, but perhaps no more so than in military aviation. The Marine Air Group's designated airshow demonstration pilot was a captain, an 03, who was assigned as an instructor at the Hornet Training Squadron, VMFAT-101. In accordance with the group's airshow demonstration instruction, signed by Colonel Kadick, this captain had practiced the demo routine dozens of times in the months leading up to the annual El Toro Air Show. Ten days before the show, Colonel Kadick informed the designated demo pilot that he would be flying the demo instead. And while unorthodox and surprising, this decision wasn't uncharacteristic of Colonel Kadick, who, according to some of his former subordinates, was capable of wielding his power and authority in what could be judged during leadership training as inappropriate ways, often seemingly just because he could. The qualified demo pilot, the captain, being a good Marine, said, Roger that, sir, and stepped aside, assuming that the officer three ranks senior to him knew what he was doing. So Colonel Kadick, whose call sign was Kamikaze, by the way, started practicing for the air show with days instead of months to prepare. And over the course of those handful of practices, a troubling trend started to appear. Keith Espo Esplin was a Canadian Air Force pilot on an exchange tour as the F-18 Hornet class desk officer at the U.S. Naval Safety Center in Norfolk, Virginia, when the 1988 El Toro Air Show happened. The Naval Safety Center was uh, privy to his uh, HUD tapes that... um for his practices. So we, uh, we viewed and witnessed uh, three practices. And of course, he's starting at a higher altitude to begin with and, um, and has to work down to an air show height, I believe he's, he starts it at 500 feet. Um, and during the course of watching his HUD tapes during the practices, we discovered that as he, as he got lower in the practice, his actual maneuvering was uh, the apex on this particular maneuver was getting lower and he was also getting slower. The third practice was a real eye opener because um, basically when you watch his HUD tape and the nose proceeding towards the ground and then he pulls the nose up, you get a view of a hanger in the HUD tape, very, very close. It was estimated by the people that were around me looking at it, it was probably in the region between 50 and 25 feet. So somewhere very close to like actually hitting a building on his third practice. The demo pilot captain watched the practices and voiced his concern, but whatever the reaction to that was up the chain of command, it didn't prevent the group commander from performing on the day of the air show. Which brings up another tenet of military aviation, and that's swallowing your pride and checking your ego if you're not hacking it, even if you're at the top of the chain of command. That's the high road, and there's no negative judgment associated with those who do it. In fact, even commanding officers of the Blue Angels have done it in recent history when they realized they were unable to keep up with the demands of the team's airborne demonstration. They told on themselves and accepted that they needed to let someone else lead the formation in spite of understanding how high visibility that call would be. But Colonel Kadick didn't do that. So on April 24th, 1988, he launched in his Hornet one of the warm-up acts before the Blue Angels were to perform in front of a crowd of 150,000 aviation fans who were enjoying a beautiful day in Southern California. The first part of his demonstration went fine, but when he got to a pull into the vertical known in aerobatic terms as an Immelman, his troubling trend from his few practice sessions reappeared. The investigators were able to piece together his exact sort of movements and speed entries into the maneuver itself. He actually started the maneuver in the first pull up into the vertical uh, 50 knots slow. So he's already slow. And then he didn't have the afterburner going either. So the afterburner came in about halfway up that first vertical maneuver. And therefore it all ended up being slow and low over the top. Let's go to the training aids. According to the approved Air Group Hornet demonstration instruction, 
The Immelman, or hybrid Immelman, because a pure Immelman results in the airplane flying upright, should have been followed by a few seconds of inverted flight, then into a split S maneuver, which is a vertical pull towards the ground. Where things always get a little difficult, let's call it maybe a little ropey, is in the vertical maneuvering, especially when you're putting that nose down towards the ground, straight vertical. When you graft everything out and then you take the actual data from the air show, and even in his own words, he knew where he was. Like I've seen an interview where he said, I'm at 87 knots on the top and he's at 2,150 feet, I believe. So you take out the elevation of El Toro, which is about 338 feet. So he's got about 18, 1,800 and 12 feet working, you know, in a vertical maneuver where he's actually too slow at the top. Ironically, at that point, the captain who was the designated demo pilot was watching the show from the ground and reportedly turned to a squadron mate standing next to him and said, watch this, he always screws this up. So inverted at the top, too low and too slow, Colonel Kadick pulled the stick aft and pointed his jet straight toward the ground. You can see here, he actually bunted the nose on the way down. More on that later, but he was in trouble and he knew it. To the Hornet's credit, he was able to get the nose way up, but it was too late. It's an amazing airplane, you know, compared to other airplanes out there about, you know, how much angle of attack it can, it can pull. And, you know, everybody's saying, well, he had full control. He brought the nose up. Yeah, he did. You, you, you have that ability, but, uh, but you don't have any lift. The airplane slammed into the ground and skidded several thousand feet down the runway and across the infield, hitting one of the arresting gear engines and trailing flames the whole time. He survived the 75G impact but was severely injured. His face was crushed. His neck was broken in three places. Five ribs were shattered. Both legs and an arm were broken and both ankles were splintered into hundreds of fragments. He was rushed by ambulance to a nearby civilian hospital, and surgeons who did the initial exam feared he might never walk again. Post-mishap analysis showed that Colonel Kadick did have some options when he started the maneuver that ultimately went wrong. If he was processing it properly and decided to make it an Immelman and actually roll the aircraft out, probably had a reasonable uh, chance. You know, the airplane is at an air show weight. It's in an air show configuration. Normally, Normally thrust to weight is better and where he would have been like then one to one. So if he had another six or 700 feet, would he have been able to actually get enough acceleration and lift to avoid hitting the ground? I was at the Naval Safety Center as the editor of Approach Magazine. At the same time, ESPO was the Hornet class desk analyst. Approach is filled with articles submitted by fleet aviators talking about mistakes they made or recommendations they had for how to make naval aviation safer. One day I received an article called Cobra in the Basket, which was written by an aviation physiologist on Colonel Kadick's behalf. This article's thesis was that although the Hornet's HUD is focused to infinity, it still takes cognition, brain power, to process the data there, which takes time even if it's milliseconds. So what the author was claiming was that the bunt you see during the downward portion of the split S was actually caused by Colonel Kadick processing his airspeed and altitude in the HUD, and therefore he was a victim of an inherent design flaw in that system. As was the process when I received articles like this, I forwarded to the class desk officer, in this case ESPO, for review. Long story short, having conducted the Naval Safety Center's review of Colonel Kadick's mishap, ESPO rejected the article's thesis because it didn't mention the actual causal factor, which was the fact that the colonel entered the maneuver too low and too slow. And as a result of ESPO's input, the article was never published in Approach Magazine. So what are the takeaways here for other aviators, whether they're military or civilian? So in a nutshell, you have a supervisor, you have a commanding officer of uh, the entire Marine Air Group that overexerted his authority to take over and fly an air show where he is qualified, but not proficient to actually uh, fly it. And in this business, it's very unforgiving uh, business. And obviously a mishap ensued. He was fortunate to, to live uh, incredible impact forces. When you look at causal factors and then you look at uh, recommendations, uh, obviously uh, this should have never happened. And for the record, the Blue Angels did perform following the Hornet crash that day. 
The findings of the mishap report signaled an end to Colonel Kadick's otherwise promising career that certainly would have seen him selected for promotion to Brigadier General and follow on Air Wing Command. He did a laudable job of spending his remaining years in Southern California trying to rehabilitate his reputation as an aviator. He became a civilian airshow pilot and started a company called Tactical Military Air Training Systems, which tested a unique laser and smoke system designed to let military pilots engaging in training ACM sorties know instantly if simulated missiles had found their targets. Jerry Kadick died suddenly in his home on August 4, 2015. He was 72 years old. All right, that'll do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything going forward. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarroll. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.